Good morning and welcome. I'm Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and a faculty member in the Government Department and the Law Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Georgetown and the Berkeley Center to today's conversation called Here I Stand, Conscience, Reformation, and Religious Freedom Across the Centuries. The work of the Berkeley Center amidst the larger scholarly work of Georgetown University is to explore the role of religion within world affairs in both theoretical and practical terms. The now 500 year, one day old reformation is one hotly, perhaps one of the most hotly contested examples of the impact for better or worse, depending on your view, of religious piety and practice in world affairs and political order. Luther's own legacy is open to much debate from the hagiography of some of the biographies to the laying at his feet the blame for all the deficiencies of modernity. Take your pick among the current work on those sides. My own interest in theological ethics and political theology bear this out as Luther staked out theological claims about the inherent limits of the power of the political state and the centrality of subjective conscience, in, especially in his early benchmark letter on temporal authority, while ambiguously making political claims later in his life and setting off a process in which his immediate and successive followers acted in ways that are even diametrically opposed to what he laid out in these early works. There is much to sort through in the next 500 years. Legacies matter, and part of Luther's legacy is his impact on later liberal, political liberalism, which we in the US inherited in some forms. One beacon of Luther's positive influence on my account is his insistence on the inviability of conscience and subjective intentionality, which is seen in our own foundational notions of conscience. For instance, in a letter James Madison sent to Francis L. Schaeffer dated December 3, 1821, Madison commented on Schaeffer's address given during the ceremony for laying a, a cornerstone at St. Matthew's Church in New York. And I quote from Madison. Your address illustrates the excellence of a system which, by a due distinction, to which the genius and courage of Luther led the way, between what is due to Caesar and what is due to God best promotes the discharge of both obligations. The experience of the United States is a happy disproof of the error so long rooted in the unenlightened minds of well-meaning Christians, as well as in the corrupt hearts of persecuting usurpers that without a legal incorporation of religious and civil polity, neither could be supported. A mutual independence is found most friendly to practical religion, to social harmony, and to political prosperity." End quote. While this framework seems straightforward, we, especially the diverse people in this audience, know the historical and current struggles over how to interpret and apply this, quote, mutual independence and, quote, due distinction in real lives in real time. Our event today continues this interpretive work and the struggle for the meaning and scope of human dignity, conscience, and freedom within and sometimes beyond political and legal orders. Our panelists today are distinguished thinkers who take up these themes, and I welcome them today on behalf of Georgetown and the Berkeley Center. Now, I would like to turn it over to Tom Farr, who is the director of the Religious Freedom Research Project and a faculty colleague in the Berkeley Center, where he is a senior fellow. Um, I will be the person to make the note to please turn off cell phones, noise-making devices, and other things that might disrupt uh, your neighbors from uh, participating today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I was delayed by turning off my cell phone. Um, let me add my welcome to that of Michael, to uh, all of you for what promises to be a, a very important but a continuation of a longstanding tradition of discussions and uh, controversies uh, and debates on the meaning and nature of religious freedom. I'm Tom Farr, as Michael said, director of the Religious Freedom Research Project here at the Berkeley Center. And those of you who are familiar with our work know that today's conference continues a long tradition here at Georgetown, seven years to be precise, not 500, but it's still uh, 
a long period in my own uh, life. Uh, seven years of public symposia, lively conversations, and debates concerning the meaning and value of religious freedom. Um, our strategic partner at the Religious Freedom Research Project is Baylor University's uh, Institute for Studies of Religion, which uh, will be represented today, if it's not already, by Professor Byron Johnson. I know he's here, the uh, director of the Institute for Studies of Religion, who's traveled here today from Texas for this important conference. So, as Michael said, today we, we gather to commemorate uh, the Reformation. We're actually here, in effect, to commemorate that, but also a contemporary event connected to it, and that is the uh, publication of a two-volume work of our scholars entitled Christianity and Freedom, edited by Tim Shaw and Alan Hertzke, both of whom you'll hear from uh, later today. The volumes, the two volumes set, Christianity and Freedom, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives, respectively, are part of the Cambridge Studies in Law and Christi Christianity and were published by Cambridge University Press. They consist of historical and contemporary essays by leading scholars, many of whom are with us today, on the contributions of Christians and Christian ideas to the concept and practice of freedom. The volumes are part of a longer project which Tim will describe uh, a bit more fully in a moment. They reflect our attempt to understand more fully the Christian contributions to freedom, including both the noble and, if you will, the not so noble. Before I turn the podium over to Tim Shaw, let me say a word, if I might, about the Religious Freedom Research Project. Our goal has been these years and continues to be that of building knowledge about religious freedom through research and scholarship. We fund scholars who publish books and articles, as do we. For example, we published at the Berkeley Center five source books on religious freedom from the five major world traditions. We've written and held conferences about the worldwide crisis in religious persecution and how it is harming societies, as well as religious minorities of all groups, including Muslims, Jews, Christians, and others. We hold public lectures and do media appearances. We train diplomats and other American officials about the meaning and value of religious freedom. Uh, and if you don't think they need training, you're probably in the wrong place today. We testify before Congress and other legislative bodies abroad. But today, we gather to uh, converse, debate, and examine religious freedom within the various Christian traditions. And Michael has already given you a little flavor for some of the, uh, some of the controversies, some of the interesting aspects of that debate. I wouldn't lay all of modern uh, society's ills on Martin Luther, uh, just most of them as a Catholic, speaking as a Catholic. We're going to have, in effect, an intra-Christian conversation about the roots of not only the modern understanding of religious freedom, but modern liberal democracy as well. So let's get to it. I'm going to ask my colleague Tim Shaw to come to the stage. Tim is Director for International Research of the Religious Freedom uh, Research Project. He's Research Professor of Government at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion. He's also Senior Advisor and Director of the South and Southeast Asia Action Team with the Religious Freedom Institute, which is a separate nonprofit that he and I and others uh, have recently begun. Tim previously served as Associate Director of the Berkeley Center's Religious Freedom Project and Associate Professor of the Practice of Religion and Global Politics at Georgetown's uh, Government Department. He is the author of, among other things, and listen to this title, Even If There Is No God, Hugo Grotius and the Secular Foundations of Modern Political Liberalism, forthcoming from Oxford University Press, and with Monica Duffy Toft and Dan Philpott, who's with us today, the highly acclaimed God's Century, uh, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. Tim, join us on the stage. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, let me assure you that I'm the last of the warm-up acts before the great Robert Wilkin, only one more warm-up act uh, before we hear from uh, the great uh, Robert Wilkin, uh, and we're all looking forward to hearing from him. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here so uh, early. 
uh, after uh, whatever form your late night Halloween revelry may have taken uh, last night, or maybe you were up late celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, but in any case, you're here uh, this morning. So thank you all very, very much, uh, and it really is a delight to have you here. I realize that uh, uh, it, it may be a bit odd, uh, I think, in, in uh, the minds of many of you that we're having a commemoration of the Protestant Reformation here at uh, Georgetown University, uh, a respectable uh, Catholic university. Isn't that a bit like celebrating the 4th of July in Buckingham Palace or you know, celebrating uh, Milton Friedman's birthday in the Kremlin? Um, well, so let me, let me explain a bit uh, to set the, set the stage for our conversation. While the publishing of the 95 Theses in October 1517 was something of a prelude. The real launch of the Reformation, as historians know, was probably not until 1521, when Martin Luther declared famously uh, his great, here I stand. Here I stand, said Luther, I can do no other. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor rightful to go against conscience. If these words are roughly what Luther said, and we have to concede to historians that we don't know whether they're exactly what he said, but if they are roughly what he said, then Luther truly took a remarkable, stirring, lonely stand on the ground of conscience, Conscience not as self-authorizing, but conscience as an indispensable path to the truth, to the truth in this case about the word of God. And because the path to the truth had to pass through his conscience, Martin Luther could not permit any human authority, whether ecclesiastical or temporal, to coerce his conscience. Now the standard conventional fabled narrative is that in taking this stand on the ground of conscience, Luther was issuing a radical new declaration of intellectual independence, a declaration that would not only deconstruct medieval Christendom, but also construct the modern world. Everyone from Hegel to Talal Assad to traditionalist Catholic historians to many Protestant thinkers have all suggested that Luther's stand on conscience was a revolutionary turn. It was, in their view, a turn that reconstructed Western religion into a matter of interior, voluntary, individual belief, and it reconstructed the very human being as a radically independent individual, an independent self. Now, there is no question, of course, that revolutionary consequences did ultimately flow from Luther's revolutionary stand. And there's no question that Luther would eventually put his stand of conscience to revolutionary uses. But the proposition that we're going to explore today, and the proposition that we explore in the volumes that Tom mentioned, Christianity and Freedom, uh, is, I think, important now uh, for me to articulate. I should say, by the way, that our volumes, Christianity and Freedom, uh, I think, are now available for sale in the, in the back of the room. Uh, so please get your copy. In honor of the Reformation, they're only uh, $500. Uh, so it's a real bargain from Cambridge University Press. Uh, actually, they, they were $500, but they're no longer $500. And, uh, they're quite uh, reasonable. And speaking of the, the volumes and purchasing the volumes, uh, I just got word uh, from the Pope uh, who was present at our launch uh, of, these, uh, uh, of this project uh, in December 2013, uh, that he uh, will actually grant anyone who purchases uh, the, the books, you have, to, you have to pay for the books. Once you pay for the books, then he will grant a papal indulgence. Um, so he, he, th he, he thought that would be an appropriate way to honor the, uh, the anniversary of the Reformation. So, so, so Really, you should go and buy these, buy these books. It's, it's the proposition of the books. It's the proposition to be discussed and debated today in our conference that the standard fabled narrative needs to be challenged. Uh, what we uh, want to propose, what we propose to discuss and debate today is that the one thing 
that was not new or unique in Luther's Here I Stand was precisely his stand on the ground of conscience. We think that Luther's claimed ground of conscience became the state or the site of a battleground, of course, between individualist innovators and traditionalist defenders of communitarian integrity and authority. We think that is what happened. But in a nutshell, it's the claim of our uh, volumes, and it's what we're going to discuss today, the central claim that we're going to discuss today, that the proposition that conscience is sacred ground, that conscience has sacred duties, that con conscience has sacred rights, is not and should not be a battleground between Catholics and Protestants, or between Orthodox and Protestants, between pre-Lutheran traditional Christianity and post-Lutheran modern Christianity. Instead, it is more accurate to see the proposition that conscience is sacred ground, not as a battleground, but as common ground across the Christian tradition. On this view, Luther's stand of conscience per se was not the revolutionary root of something new, though again, Luther did put his stand of conscience to revolutionary uses. Rather, Luther's stand of conscience was arguably the intellectual fruit of something very old, uh, very long standing, uh, very deep in the Christian tradition. It reflected a high view of the dignity uh, and the self-determining character of the human person going back to the church fathers including Augustine and Chrysostom and Gregory of Nyssa and Tertullian, people you'll be hearing a lot about today, but reflecting even more deeply and more anciently the words of the first chapter of Genesis in the Hebrew scriptures. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Today we will discuss and explore and debate all these ancient roots of the idea that conscience is sacred ground. And we will also discuss the fruits of this radical idea, particularly in a panel that my dear friend and colleague and co-editor Alan Hertzke will lead this afternoon. We'll discuss the fruits of this radical idea, including the contemporary fruits today uh, of the idea that conscience is sacred. Uh, and one uh, fruit of this idea is the steady insistence across the centuries on the idea that religious freedom is universal, uh, that it applies to all people, not just Christians, but non-Christians, that it is something whose truth is so profound and so hardwired, if you will, uh, in human nature, that its truth can be understood and embraced uh, even by people who are not Christian believers who uh, do not uh, accept uh, the theological propositions of the Christian faith. Indeed, we'll note today, uh, remarkably, that numerous Christian writers, such as Tertullian and Lactantius and many other thinkers, uh, such as Bartolome de las Casas and Roger Williams, across the centuries formulated their defenses of freedom of religion and conscience in terms of what we would today call public reason because of their particular understandings of human nature, of reason and natural law, it is not just that they, that they fully believed that religious freedom was something to which non-Christians as much as Christians were entitled. It was also that they expected and believed that religious freedom was something that non-Christians can understand, can embrace and endorse even from their own distinct points of view. We think these arguments, ideas, have enormous relevance and importance today in a world in which, of course, uh, there remains so much religious restriction all around the world. And with that, my warm-up act is over, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, the great uh, Robert Louis Wilkin. Today is not only the day after Halloween, uh, the day after uh, 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 Reformation Day, it's also All Saints Day. Uh, and if I may say so, Robert Wilkin has been the patron saint of our project uh, in the Religious Freedom Research Project on Christianity and Freedom. Uh, he has become a wonderful friend. Uh, he has been and was the inspiration in many ways for the launching of our work uh, on the historical roots of the idea of religious freedom. Robert Louis Wilkin is the William R. Kennan, Jr. Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Virginia Emeritus. 
He is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, past president of the American Academy of Religion, the North American Patristic Society, and the Academy of Catholic Theology. He is today chairman of the board of the Institute on Public Life, uh, Institute on Religion and Public Life, which is the publisher of First Things magazine. I'm not going to read his entire biography uh, so that you can actually have time to hear from uh, Robert. I'll only note two additional items. One is that his most recent book uh, is called, get this, The First Thousand Years, A Global History of Christianity with Yale University Press in which Robert uh, covers the first thousand years of Christian history. Uh, 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 he's also written, I'll mention one other thing, a beautiful book called The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, Seeking the Face of God. And I will mention now that he is working on a new book, uh, which is under contract with Yale, Yale University Press with the working title, Liberty in the Things of God, the Christian Origins of Religious Freedom, which we're proud to say uh, is a project that, that, as it were, came out of the work that we did together uh, for the Christianity and Freedom uh, volume. So let me uh, now uh, welcome uh, our patron saint, uh, Robert Wilkin, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy. I, uh, exalted language is quite unnecessary. It's All Saints Day. And in the liturgy for All Saints Day, there's a passage from the book of Revelation about the 144,000 who have suffered through the tribulation and now stand in white robes before the throne of God, singing praise and honor to the one God. And the talk that I'm going to give, I'm very pleased that we're doing it on, on All Saints Day because the role that the Reformation played in the development of religious freedom was only possible because of the saints who lived in the 1500 years before the Reformation. That's my basic theme. Now, when Timothy asked me to do this, I said, Timothy, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to give a summary of your book. And I said, Timothy, that is no way to write a lecture. <laughs> you need some stories. So I'm going to tell you two stories about the Reformation that I think will illustrate how the Reformation brought about a deeper understanding of things that had been present in the Christian tradition long before the Reformation appeared. Because he wanted me to keep it into 40 minutes, and it's not going to be a long lecture. I'm not going to be able to tell you the first part of the history that leads up to this. I can only hint at that in a little conclusion at the end. I'm only going to focus because the topic is Reformation. So that's kind of the theme here. The rhetoric of the reformers of the 16th century called for a renewal of the medieval church. But what they wrought was not the rebirth of an earlier and purer form of Christian faith and practice. The Reformation inaugurated a great transformation in Western civilization with far-reaching consequences for the relation between religion and public life. In the decades following the public presentation of Martin Luther's 95 Theses in 1517, the institutional unity and cultural cohesion of Western Christendom was breaking apart, caught between a vanishing past and an uncertain future. With the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, the Elizabethan Restoration in England in 1559, and the organization of the Calvinist churches in France in the 1560s, the old world was fading in memory. What began as a theological and institutional critique of the church gave rise to confessional communities holding distinctive beliefs and practices that led to the eclipse of Christendom, a society united by faith, and the emergence of Europe 
a culture defined by geography. The seismic shifts within Western Christendom created unprecedented social fracturing in communities all over Europe. How were kings, princes, and city magistrates to deal with religious divisions that ran down the main street of their communities? The nonconformists were neighbors, friends, merchants, and craftsmen who had been linked by bonds of faith and love for place. But the spread of reform turned communities against themselves. In this environment, political leaders, religious thinkers, and philosophers drew on a common Christian heritage to address conflicts in rapidly changing societies. By knitting the, the certainties of the past to the tumultuous present, ancient ideas were refashioned and over the course of several generations made to fit the new social and religious landscape. In the 16th century, the fault line on religious liberty ran between those who ruled and those who were ruled, not between Catholics and Protestants. In the German-speaking cities and territories of the Holy Roman Empire, Lutheran princes and city leaders raised long-standing institutions and practices to put in place a new order. In the cities of Switzerland, Calvinists drove out Catholic clergy, outlawed celebration of the mass, forcing those who held to the old ways to submit to the new discipline. In France, where the Reformation grew from the ground up, Catholic rulers suppressed the Huguenots, that is the Calvinists, who were adherents of the new religion. In the southern provinces of the Low Country, Protestants were persecuted by Catholics, while in Holland and Zeeland in the north, Calvinists prohibited Catholics from practicing their faith. In England in mid-century, the Catholics were persecuted by the Reformed Church of England, and at the beginning of the 17th century, the fledgling Baptists were suppressed or driven into exile by King James I. Initially, accommodation for religious dissenters was advanced under the banner of sufferance or toleration. But by the beginning of the 7th century, free exercise of religion began to be considered a natural right. So here's my first story. The Reformation first took root in cities. Well, let's look at one city, Nuremberg in Bavaria. In the 16th century, Nuremberg had a population of some 25,000 persons. It was one of dozens of imperial cities, that is a city that belonged to the Holy Roman Empire, but in truth, self-sufficient and free to act on its own independently of the emperor. The supreme authority in Nuremberg was the city council, made up of 42 men, many of whom were members of old patrician families. Nuremberg had an Augustinian community, and Luther, an Augustinian monk, Luther's writings were carried there by his Augustinian brothers. And shortly after the 95 Theses were published, a humanist in Nuremberg translated them into German, and in October 1518, Luther actually visited the city on the way to Augsburg to meet with Cardinal Cajetan. By 1525, early, the city council had removed Nuremberg from the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Bamberg, and in 1528, Catholic rites were officially abolished. And, became, and Nuremberg became one of the first cities to prepare its own church order. That means a legal document setting forth Lutheran doctrine, prescribing uniform liturgical practices for the churches in the city and the rural communities, and establishing the office of superintendent to oversee the clergy. As reforms were being imposed, the city magistrates set about closing down the monasteries. However, when they came to the Sisters of Clare, a community of religious women with a long history in the city, the women firmly told the city fathers they had no business interfering in their spiritual life. In 1524, the abbess of the con convent, a woman named Caritas 
Pirkheimer began to keep a diary that gives a firsthand account of changes as they were being imposed on the sisters. She tells a gripping story of intimidation and harassment by city magistrates and reform clergy. That means Lutheran clergy. One of the first actions of the council was to order the sisters to send away the Franciscan priests who had served the con con convent and heard their confessions. On Good Friday, 1525, priests were forbidden to say mass in the convent, depriving the sisters of the sacrament. To replace the banished Franciscans, the council installed new clergy sympathetic to the reform. On one occasion, writes Pirkeimer, this Franciscan nun, Lutheran women, along with Lutheran pastors and a cantor, arranged to sing a German mass in our church. We all ran from the choir and did not hear it. <laughs> it's a lively document, I tell you. The sisters resented that the city council sent evangelical clergy to preach long sermons to convince them to accept Luther's teachings. In all, they had to listen to 111 sermons. The magistrates also dispatched agents to watch that the sisters were present at the sermons and to see whether or not they stuffed wool in their ears. <laughs> they were forbidden to ring bells for the hours of prayer, and one day men came in to lock the choir, making it impossible to gather for prayer. They were ordered to stop wearing their habits and told to take apart the material, dye it a different color, and sew new clothing. The aim of these orders, writes Pirkeimer, was to destroy our cloister and our spiritual life. And in a poignant passage, he says that the convent had served God for 250 years, and now we are being forced to accept the new faith. Now, as dramatic as Pirkeimer's tale of the destruction of a monastery of women what is more telling is how she defends her community. Again and again, she says the sisters are being deprived of their spiritual freedom. We hope, she writes, that the Honorable City Council will not apply pressure in matters which concern our conscience and force us to act against our wills to confess what the authorities want us to say. To which she adds, we cannot find in our conscience that we should believe and hold fast to what everyone wants us to do and abandon the faith and order of the Holy Church. Do not accept, ask us to accept the faith we do not believe in. Even the Turks do not coerce anyone. God wishes our conference, consciences to be free. It would be a terrible, pitiful affair if we, in addition to the physical enclosure to which we have willingly submitted, would be imprisoned in our consciences in which the freedom of the gospel is being preached. Pirkeimer's appeal to conscience is not simply a rhetorical ploy. It carries theological heft. She writes, no one can show us from the holy gospel that anyone is to be coerced or put under pressure. For her, conscience was not an appeal to private judgment, but the assurance of faith formed by the scriptures and the church's tradition, a living intelligence that moved her thoughts and her actions. We cannot do anything against the faith, against reason, or against our conscience. If we did, we would bring judgment on ourselves. It is deeply ironic that in defending fidelity to the old religion, Pirkeimer deploys language similar, if not identical, to what Martin Luther used to defend himself at the Diet of Worms in 1521. When asked to recant his teachings, he replied, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils, for they have con contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. 
Now, according to the official transcript of the proceedings, Luther's statement ended at this point. But his supporters in Wittenberg said that he had ended his speech with the words, here I stand and cannot do otherwise. There is, however, no evidence of this. But one of the sisters of the Franciscan community, Katharina Ebner, did say, here I stand and I will not yield. Katharina Ebner, a Franciscan sister, said, here I stand and will not yield. Whether she was the first to use the phrase, here I stand, I do not know. It is possible the sisters had heard of Luther's declamation at Worms <coughs> and deliberately mimicked him, standing up to the unjust demands of the council. But maybe not. The more telling point is that the Franciscans and Martin Luther shared a common understanding of conscience handed on in the medieval church. Freedom of conscience was not the creation of the Reformation. It was embedded in Christian thinking, in the Christian mind, long before the 16th century. Pierkeimer had another argument. When official representatives of the council were, were, were sent to plead with the sisters, they knew well, she says, that we had always obeyed them before in temporal things. But what concerned our soul, we could follow nothing but our own conscience. She was not simply complaining that the magistrates had disrupted the life of her community. She was making, however, succinctly a theological argument based on the medieval distinction of powers. It is not the task of civic rulers to determine spiritual matters. The magistrates had transgressed a boundary Christians held sacred. The distinction of powers was given its classical formulation by Pope Gelasius in the early 6th century. There are two powers, he writes, by which this world is clearly ruled, namely the sacred authority of the priest and the royal power. Christ separated the offices of both powers according to their proper activities and special dignities. And of course, what he's reflecting are the words of Jesus rendered to Caesar, the things that are of Caesar, and to God, the things that are of God. Okay, that's my first story. Second story. Vincent Nuremberg disclosed that the distinction of powers was a major point of conflict from the very beginning of the Reformation. By the 1530s, only a remnant of the old religion remained in the city. But a new threat had arisen, the emergence of the Anabaptists, a more radical reform calling for adult or believer's baptism, hence the name Anabaptists rebaptized. They claimed to return to the Christianity of the New Testament when the church was made up of small communities of fervent believers. But it was not what they believed, what the Anabaptists believed, but what they did that provoked the magistrates. They established independent religious communities that threatened the traditional view that religion was the vinculum societatis, the bond that held the city together. By insisting that church membership was voluntary, the Anabaptists threatened social peace. And as one member of the city council put it, the devil seeks to open a terrible breach in our ranks so that the word of God, true uniform religion, Christian order, and the power of the sword of secular government will be completely reduced to rubble. But not all agreed. A man by the name of George Freilich, who was a clerk in the city chancellery, wrote a memorandum entitled where the secular government has the right to wield the sword in matters of, religion, of faith. He challenged the presumption that the city magistrates had authority to carry out religious reforms in the city. The resurrection had resurrected an historic debate within Christianity over the relation between spiritual authority and political power. In the medieval world, it was an affair of the Pope 
and the emperor, our king. In 16th century Nuremberg, it took a different form. Do secular officials have authority, city magistrates, have authority to regulate the religious practices and beliefs of all citizens? Where, as Freilich, do the magistrates get the right to control faith, either by executing those who do not wish to be of their faith or else tearing them from property and goods, wife and children, and banishing them from the territory, which was done. The only justification they give, says Freilich, it is, a, it is their duty to protect people in temporal matters, and a fortiori, they should do so in spiritual matters. Now, his support, this runs through all the writings of uh, religious freedom, the magistrates appoint to the kings of ancient Israel who promoted true worship, abolished idolatry, and destroyed idols. But, says Freilich, in the Old Testament, there was a single commonwealth ruled by a king anointed by God. The New Testament speaks of two kingdoms on earth, one spiritual, one secular. And nowhere suggests that secular government should dictate religious matters. Christ rules a spiritual kingdom, and secular rulers have sovereignty only over temporal matters. Just as each realm has its king, so each has its own scepter, goal, and end. A steel sword is of no use in forcing people to adhere to this or that faith, because belief rests on persuasion, not coercion. Now, Freilich, and this is really getting to the heart of the matter, Freilich acknowledged that the city council cannot allow discordant preaching, rebaptizing, polluted sacraments and ceremonies, and above all, the public abomination of the mass. But a sect, it's his term, should be free to follow its own faith, to establish and observe its doctrines and ceremonies, to engage and dismiss ministers, and to meet in separate places, his words. What is more, the government should not prohibit persons moving from one faith and being received into another. In short, he envisions a society, which does not exist, in which one religion would be established and maintained by civil authority, but which would allow other faiths to be practiced. Significantly, he mentions the Anabaptists and the Jews but by now, the Catholics are out of the picture. Don't even, doesn't even mention them. Now, Frederick is a minor player in the Reformation, and his ideas got little hearing among the zealous reformers in Nuremberg. But he discerned something that escaped others. With the collapse of the Corpus Christianum, Christendom, and the formation of confessional communities, a way had to be found to accommodate dissenting groups within the social body. The situation called for a new approach to nonconformism. So he makes a case for tolerance, sufferance of beliefs and practice offensive to the people and rulers. So his argument is in part pragmatic. The magistrates cannot kill all those who dissent. But it was supported by the ancient belief that religious, ancient conviction that religious belief could not be coerced and that religious faith was an inner disposition of the heart and mind. He stands on the same ground as the sisters, the Franciscan sisters. What irked the city magistrate was not the beliefs of private individuals, but the public display of a form of Christianity different from that of the officially sanctioned religion. People should not, it was asserted, on the basis of their chosen faith, be allowed to establish a new assembly and a preaching office in a community that is not theirs to govern and in which they have no public authority. This would be a public crime. Citizens have no authority to call a preacher, that is, to organize a separate religious association. In our language, to form a church. In private, they can follow their consciences, but they are prohibited from forming separate religious fellowships. Let everyone believe and confess for himself whatever he wishes. That is no concern to the magistrates. But it does concern the magistrate when someone establishes a new sect or a new preaching office within, without permission. 
Now, what is at work here is a new concept of the church. What Ernst Trouch called the sect type church, by contrast to the church type. The church type <clears throat> represents a form of Christianity <clears throat> that seeks to embrace the society as a whole. The sect type is a small gathered community of committed believers who exist independently of the state-supported religion. This new form of the church was a frontal challenge to the medieval view that religion and political life were complementary. As the French axiom had, had it for centuries, one faith, one law, one king. So two points. The Reformation gave life to the medieval teaching that the world was governed by two powers, one spiritual and the other temporal, albeit <clears throat> in a radically new form. And it brought into being a new form of Christian life, the church as a voluntary association. Now, during the Reformation, the doctrine of the two powers received its classical formulation in the writings of John Calvin. Man, he wrote, in his institutes is under a twofold government, duplex in homine regimen. One is spiritual, whereby the conscience is instructed in piety and reverencing God. The second is political, where man is educated for the duties of humanity and citizenship that must be maintained among men. The spiritual pertains to the life of the soul and the temporal without the behavior, safety, food, housing, the needs of the present, laws which allow human beings to live together. These two realms are always to be viewed separate from one another. And it is this formulation, Calvin, that would shape thinking on religious freedom for the next 100 years, the next 100, 150 years, and is the ultimate source of the separation of church and state. And I'm not going to talk about it here. Locke almost uses exactly the same words in his letter on toleration. He had not read Calvin, but the tradition had been so powerful by that time, almost word for word. But the notion of the church as a voluntary association, the second point, is no less significant. Roger Williams, for example, seldom used church in the singular. <clears throat> for him, the most congenial term is particular churches, his designation for the covenanted fellowships of believers. He rejected outright the notion that the church is an organized corporate body, and his thinking led to a takedown of the idea of a national church. Significantly, John Locke uses the same phrase, particular churches, and draws the same conclusion. Here's Locke. A church then I take to be a voluntary society of men. And he's a member of the Church of England. The church I take to be a voluntary society of men, joining themselves together of their own accord in order to the public worshiping of God in such a manner as they judge acceptable to him and effectual to the salvation of their souls. Nor does Locke shrink from the consequences, that view. He says there is no difference between a national church and the separated congregations. Even if the magistrate joins himself to any church, the church remains as it was before, a free and voluntary society. This new understanding of the church as a voluntary society changed the calculus of religious freedom. Political and religious leaders had to make space for the public exercise of different forms of Christianity within societies that historically had been united by one religion. And this is seen most clearly by Dutch writers in the late 16th century, when Calvinist communities sought freedom from the crushing weight of Spanish rule. A person with the lovely name of Marnix of St. Aldegon. He was the burgomaster of Antwerp, a city which had been occupied by Spanish troops, put it this way. Some claim that the war to be freed from Spanish rule was undertaken to preserve the liberties of the country. But the Spanish prob promise of freedom of conscience was given with the proviso that there is no public worship and no offense is given. 
This, he said, is a trap. For it is well known that conscience, which resides in people's minds, is always free and cannot be examined by other men, much less be put under their control. No one has been ex executed merely on the grounds of religious belief. It is the public practice of religion that is offensive. There is no difference between freedom of conscience without public worship and the old rigor and inquisition of Spain. How is it possible to grant freedom of conscience without exercise of religion? How can people enjoy the benefits of freedom if they cannot gather together to worship God? If they have no ceremonies and do not invoke God to testify to the piety and reverence, they're in fact left without any religion and without fear of God. Here's the point. Religious freedom is widely thought to be about the rights of individuals to believe what they wish. But with few exceptions, the Reformation and the years following, the, first, the main exception is Sebastian Castillo's critique of Calvin. <clears throat> the great debate in the 16th century was over the rights of religious communities and the public practice of religion. Free exercise meant the right not only to hold one's confession of faith, but to gather for worship, to organize a community, to elect leaders, form the young without interference from the state. The Dutch, my final point before a brief conclusion, were among the first to argue that liberty of conscience is a natural right. A good example is a treatise entitled the Good Admonition to the Good Citizens of Brussels, 1579. It is well known, writes this anonymous author, that human freedom is located in the soul, which is the chief part of us and in view of which we are called human. Freedom of soul means freedom of conscience. This freedom means that a person may accept and hold such a religion as his conscience witnesses to him, and that no one has the right or power to hinder him or to forbid it violently. This freedom belongs to an individual by nature and by natural right, because religion is a bond that a person has with God. It is for this reason that he owes no account to anyone besides God alone. This is pungent language. It brings together in an original way ideas that had been in play for centuries. With the claim that liberty of conscience is a natural right, the winding path of thinking on religious freedom begins to straighten. By the beginning of the 17th century, the principal ideas associated with religious freedom were widely acknowledged, though only sporadically acted on. And these were that religious faith is an inner disposition of the heart and mind, hence not subject to coercion. The distinction between the civil and religious realm and conscience as a form of knowledge that carries, carries an obligation to God. In forging this constellation of concepts, Christian thinkers in the 16th and 17th century worked out the implication of ideas that had been handed on in Christian tradition, adapting, modifying, expanding them in a new social and religious world. Memory is an escapable part an inescapable feature of Christian intellectual life. And writings of the church fathers and medieval thinkers bustrous advocates of religious freedom in the 16th century. Tertullian, the third century North African Christian who first used the word, the phrase religious freedom, libertas religionis, third century, and said one person's religious ne religion neither harms nor hurts in another. Text that actually Thomas Jefferson quoted. Lactantius, a fourth century Latin writer who wrote, religious faith cannot be compelled, religio cogi non potest. Only words, not blows, can persuade. And Thomas Aquinas, who argued that conscience is not simply a soul's knowledge, conscience is an act. It was, however, only as the patrimony of the past was buffeted by the rough torrent of occasion, the Reformation, that a full doctrine of religious liberty came into being. Thank you very much.